What's up, everybody? I'm TJ. And I'm Kelsey. And we are the, the Nashville, Nashville Wine Duo. Duo. All right. It's another it's, it's podcast. It's the podcast, the travel edition. Okay, we're so excited. We are in Georgia right now. Georgia, Delanica. Yes. We've been traveling to Georgia for the past three years, visiting different wineries, and we have the utmost privilege to be at Frogtown today. It's in the Dahlonega Plateau. Frogtown Cellars. Yes. Yes. So excited. And so, we are with the winemaker himself, Craig. The winemaker, the owner. Kreitzer. Yes. <laughs> Did I get that right? Did I pronounce yeah, it? Yeah. Yes. Nailed it. <laughs> I was I was worried about that one. Nailed it, correct? Yeah. But, but we're so close now because we just did like a awesome, informative, like yeah. wine tasting with the master. I'm I'm calling him CK now. CK. Yeah, we're yeah. at that level. TJ could be CK. Yeah, <laughs> TJ CK. We're on that. We're on that level. So we're. It's an honor to have you. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, thanks for. I know you're busy. They're doing harvest party today, yeah. and um, so he's a very busy guy. But he's he's taken. A little bit of time to sit down with us and we are so appreciative of that so yeah let's dive right in tell us about yourself how'd you get into wine okay uh <laughs> well first of all um i uh went to law school most people that go to law school although this is not a requirement in any measure a lot of people go to law school and never practice law but i in fact went to law school and practiced law for almost 30 years full time and uh, I did that by uh, starting out with a small law firm in Atlanta that turned out to be much bigger than a small law firm. So uh, we started with two lawyers. And when I retired from that law firm, we had 100 lawyers. So it was really a tremendous amount of growth. Uh, it really paralleled the growth in Atlanta when we first started uh, practicing law the population in metropolitan Atlanta was a million two. And uh, 20 years ago, uh, gosh, the population was approaching around 3 million uh, people. And today, Atlanta is probably about 6.5 million met metropolitan wow. Atlanta. So this region has really grown. Um, uh, Atlanta is uh, uh, a great city. Uh, Georgia, most people don't really look at Georgia and know the fact that Georgia has everything. It has beaches, uh, uh, so it's, it's coastal Georgia is wonderful, has a great, great uh, uh, environment for people to enjoy the coastal regions. Uh, South Georgia is really one of the bread baskets of the country or the world. So we grow tremendous amount of uh, produce mm -hmm. um, uh, in South Georgia. It has the largest aquifer, which is the underground water supply of any state with the exception of California. So we grow great produce in South Georgia. And yes, Jimmy Carter, that includes peanuts. Uh, <laughs> but there's all kinds of other row crops that we grow uh, in South Georgia. And then uh, as you move north, uh, we start with the Foothills region. And that probably starts around Atlanta. Atlanta would be uh, some of Atlanta's around uh, 800, 900 foot elevation, but as you go north, you start uh, increasing the elevation. Frogtown is uh, almost exactly 60 miles directly north as the crow flies from Atlanta. And uh, our elevations here, the low elevation of the vineyard is about 1,625 feet, and the higher elevations of uh, the vineyard is 1,875 foot elevation. Wow. So we are on very, very steep inclines, which are needed tremendously in a rainy environment to try to grow uh, uh, premium wine grapes. I say that in Georgia to grow premium wine grapes, the analogy would be to a surgeon and, and the type of surgeon that you are in North Georgia growing grapes, premium wine grapes, is a brain surgeon. Now, you could be a surgeon growing premium wine grapes in uh, California, 
and you could specialize with taking somebody's appendix out, which is a much <laughs> lower, uh, lower classification of a surgeon than somebody doing being a brain surgeon. Right. So they're still surgeons, except one is at a higher, higher, more difficult, much more challenging environment than a surgeon in California removing your appendix. Right. So how did you go from working in law and the lawyer into going into the wine industry? Two things. One, I have no hobbies <laughs> in life. Uh, I have passions. Uh, my bride is my first passion, Aww. of course. And my second passion was I really developed a passion for the practice of law. So we practice law at, in my opinion, the upper echelon of legal practice. And we did that because, A, we wanted to do it, B, we think myself and other lawyers in the firm had the talent to do it, and lastly, and this is the most important thing, so yeah, you have a passion, but the other thing that you need is willpower. You have to be indefatigable. In other words, you have to approach things by the thought that I am not going to fail. Mm -hmm. Failure is not an option. So you do everything in your being. You put all of your willpower into succeeding. And the problem with a lot of people, when they do something, they, quote, try to do it. No. You don't try to do something and be successful. You make up your mind that you are going to do something. You have in your mind what you're shooting for. You're doing something. Where do you want to go? At what level do you want to achieve? And when you approach something in the fact that failure is not an option, you become indefatigable. Indefatigable people tend to be very passionate and will work to, from the beginning of daybreak to sunset and beyond, to make things happen. Mm. So I think what I did when I practiced law was I personally, my law firm, the lawyers in my law firm, we approach things from the standpoint that we are going to succeed. We are going to make things happen. Mm -hmm. And making things happen uh, means that uh, failure is not an option. So we want to do something to reach a level that we are happy with. Most of the clients don't really understand what we negotiated, how we negotiated, and the result of the negotiation, except that they were successful in selling or buying a business, for right. instance. Uh, and, of course, when we write a document, most people don't really appreciate what that document says. So a draftsman, a craftsman have created that document. And that document is done so that we're not just doing something, writing something and getting over with. We're writing something, redoing something and making it to or bringing it to the level that we're satisfied with it. And it's a very high level. Same thing with winemaking. Anybody so, could make wine. Did you feel like after you were practicing law, you had these passions, you said you didn't have hobbies, but you feel this, like you, you just, where did it come to you where you were like, okay, wine is the thing? I guess I didn't say I have a hobby because I didn't consider drinking wine as a hobby. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, uh, playing sports that I did when I was younger, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, being a musician or, or uh, being a, uh, a woodworker, mm -hmm. something that you do in addition to what you do as your job, uh, as an aside, you have a hobby. Yeah. Well, my job was my hobby. Right. There was no time, absolutely no time. So if I tried to do a hobby, I was shortchanging what I was doing regularly as my job. So I didn't really feel that I needed. But 
hey, we needed to relax and, and have some enjoyment. So right from the beginning, as I started practicing law, I started uh, discovering and developing an understanding, a really terrific understanding. We were, uh, after a while, practicing law uh, is not something like digging a ditch. It might be as hard as repeating of working hard like a ditch digger to, to accomplish the, the result. Work hard was there, but also unlike somebody digging ditches to produce revenue as a lawyer, we produced a lot of revenue. There was a discretionary aspect of spending money. So we had, we were blessed by God that we were able to take that which we earned and apply it to things that cost some money. Some have a passion for fast race cars. Well, we developed, my bride and I, a passion for fine wine. So ultimately, over a period of 25 years of practicing law, we collected over 4,000 bottles of premium Bordeaux. Good for oh you. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome. That's crazy. <laughs> and uh, anything to become knowledgeable about anything it's experimentation. Mm -hmm. So you need to go through the effort and the process of drinking wine, tasting wine. It has to be done repetitively. You have to also be willing to gain the knowledge so you understand century-wise, uh, regional-wise, what you're tasting, why you're tasting. And so again, although it's not, in my opinion, a hobby, it did require the process of repetitively drinking wine, taking that wine into your mouth, assessing the qualities of that wine, thinking about why things are the way they are, and developing a palate. So me and my bride developed a palate for very, very high quality Bordeaux French wine. So from that was the idea, did you guys like, well, we want to start a winery? No, not really at all. Oh, okay. So, uh, uh, in fact, we couldn't even perceive of the idea that we would do something other than personally practice law. Right. Remember, no hobby. Uh, my, my goodness, growing grapes and making wine, never dreamed about, never thought I'd want to do it until I finally said to myself, hey, I've been sharing myself with clients, with other people in my law firm, my partners. So the constituencies that I assumed responsibility for, after a while, I said to myself, well, maybe you ought to think about doing something for you. Yes, by satisfying the constituencies as of clients, of responsibilities to law firms, to associates, to clients and partners and whatnot, I also said that, well, maybe it's time. And the law firm was starting to get really large. I didn't know if I really wanted to continue to practice in a really, really large law firm. And so uh, while the law firm was evolving and I, uh, I, I, uh, I said I understood and agreed that the law firm should evolve, I did not know that I really wanted to be a lawyer in that type of law firm. So I started to think, and that's when I said to myself, well, what can you do <laughs> after the practice of law? What is it that you think you would like to do? And let me give a plug for Virginia Tech. They, at that time, had the only, well, Cornell was a viticulture program, mm -hmm. but primarily for uh, table grapes and uh a wine growing region oh so different than the southeast, uh, New England. But Virginia Tech and the professors at Virginia Tech and the foresight that Virginia Tech, the, the, the administration, and even the, uh, the governmental officials in Virginia had foresight to develop a viticulture program at Virginia Tech that basically said, hey, we can it may be exceedingly difficult. It may be outrageously difficult. It may be so difficult you don't even want to try. But hey, if you, if you really have um, uh, the willpower and you really want to 
have the passion to growing grapes, hey, we Virginia Tech can say you can grow premium Rhine grapes on the East Coast. As a matter of fact, if you read the literature that I did, it screamed for Georgia because we're so far south. Uh, I don't know, as much as 175, I mean, 750 miles, maybe more. Don't really record that much from, for instance, Charlottesville, Virginia, where a lot of grapes are grown, mm -hmm. that, hey, the weather patterns here are different than the weather patterns in Virginia. And the main weather pattern that is different is we're warmer. We had longer growing season. Longer growing season meant a longer time to ripen fruit, particularly red fruit. So on the East Coast, white wines were generally much more accepted by the wine drinking public than red fruit, red wines. Red wines were eschewed as, oh, not good, maybe even terrible. While well, white wines were acceptable because, again, the growing conditions were more conducive on the East Coast, particularly north of Georgia, for white wine growing and white wine production than red. But reading the information that was put out from Virginia Tech, I felt that locating in, in the northerly portion kind of foothills, upper foothills, lower uh, mountainous regions of Georgia was really a recipe for success in premium red wine growing. So what would you say separates Frogtown from other wineries and vineyards in this part of the country? Like what do you guys do different, different or special? There are a number of people like me they're not in Georgia. I don't know of another person that I would say I have ultimate respect for in grape growing and winemaking in Georgia. That's just a fact. Take that wherever the way you want to take that, but I think that's a fact. I have a close relationship with Wolf Mountain where they are really good winemakers, I believe. Mm -hmm. Wolf Mountain being another winery in Georgia. We, were there we just went there yesterday. Yeah. But they don't have the vineyards and they don't have the effort that we put in to make it happen, grape growing here. Yep. Just, that's not their protocols. That's not what they're, they're set out to do. But they make a lot of wine. Let me give you an example. So three years ago at one of a major competition in Georgia, uh, excuse me, in California, they won the best sparkling wine at that competition. It was an international competition. It included French Chardon, uh, Champagne wow. made in the Epinay region. Okay, So I didn't make that wine, but I grew the Chardonnay grapes that that wine was made from. Yeah. So people all the time would ask me, hey, why don't you make sparkling wine? Or did you ever think about uh, making sparkling wine? And I would say to him, well, do I ever think about it? Yeah. Would I do it? No. Well, why? I said, well, we grow Chardonnay grapes. We'll let our good friends at Wolf Mountain make the Chardonnay. They're very good sparkling winemakers. Oh, they have a great And <laughs> they won the best Chardonnay at San Francisco, brute yeah. Chardonnay we had a, it was at fantastic. San Francisco international oh yep. my god and they'll right away say well hey we made these grapes because they came those grapes came from frogtown yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so you you feel like in terms of like the grape growing you're kind of set apart oh the there's other. no question there's no yeah. question and somebody would be disingenuous if they even say that if you ask the uh the agriculture people of georgia you know who it is you know there could be somebody else than me, but if you are me and you and you want to grow grapes in another vineyard other than Frogtown, you're going to have to wake up early, early in the morning. You're going to have to work until dusk or nightfall every single day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to have the passion, and you're going to have to be indefatigable. There are not many people in the world that I've ever been in contact with that are indefatigable. As a matter of fact, 
there are a number of lawyers I've experienced in the, in my 50 years of being in a professional uh, life, in being a lawyer and a grape grower and a winemaker, there are a number of indefatigable lawyers. There aren't many, and I grow grapes and make wine in California. There are not a lot of indefatigable wine bros and winemakers. There are a number of them. Of course, they're all pretty much located on the West Coast. Now, again, saying that, there are some people that I do respect in the uh, Tidewater, Virginia area, and also in the Finger Lakes that grow really good grapes, mm -hmm. and really to the extent that those grapes allow them to make types of wine, make really good wine. I'm saying to you, in my estimation, it's not red wine, it's white wine, or for instance, in the uh, Finger Lakes area, it's ice wine. Mm -hmm. They grow tremendous Vidal, mm -hmm. make tremendous ice wine, world-class beyond world-class white wines. And if I were in the Finger Lakes uh, district, I would dedicate myself to those types of uh, grape growing and winemaking. I think that you are just so amazing. We did try some wines before we started this. We tried a Sangiovese. Well, it was a super Tuscan mm -hmm. made with Sangiovese. And then we had a, um, a white. Marsan. Marsan, right? And... Um, Won a best of class they, designation. They 100% were. Um, I mean, I was just blown away, honestly. And I can tell that your, you and your wife's knowledge of these Bordeaux wines and this French influence, like I can tell like your palate, you, like you know these wines, like because you've just studied them. Like you're, I, in my opinion, I think you're a master in learning about these wines. And when you try them, you feel like you're tasting something from France, like which is crazy because we're in Georgia. Um, and I just feel like a lot of your life and your passion and what you went through and being a lawyer, I can see that that influence has heavily affected your what you have going on here. And you, you really want things to be ethical and honest. And um, you're not trying to give somebody a, you know, a product that you don't 100% back up. And, um, you know, you had talked to just about how a lot of people can do that. And I think that's in any industry, like anything that gets massive and we're giving things to a consumer it's very easy to just hide it by a certain thing or, you know, whatever. And it's like, you're like, I know I can do that, but I'm not going to do that because that's wrong. And I really, really want people to have something that they can believe and trust and drink and know that it's, it's not a, a BS product. Like it's, and I just think that that, that, that takes a really big person and you don't meet people like that so often. Um, so I've just been, I've just loved talking to you today. And I just, I'm being really honest. Like it's just, it's, it's given me more faith in the wine industry. I'm like starting uh -huh. to cry. I'm like, it's just making me emotional, but I'm going to stop. <laughs> yes. So real fast, because I know we're going to run out of time because you're a busy man. You compared Delonica region right. to France, Bordeaux region. Quickly, like, describe that again yeah. for listeners. All right. So let's do it really quickly. Yeah. Uh, let yeah. me say I'm waiting to go to process grapes that my wine club members and I harvested two and three hours ago from, <laughs> from our vineyard. And we are in what we call Harvest Day with Craig. So we invite our wine club members, and there are approximately 80 of them today that harvest grapes in the morning, uh, have breakfast, lunch, and dinner here. After uh, breakfast, we harvest the grapes before uh, lunch. Uh, we set up the winemaking equipment during while they're having lunch, and we're now ready to go down and process those grapes that we harvested and followed by a big harvest dinner. So if you're interested in that, yes. you know, become a wine club member, you could go on frogtownwine.com yes. and you become a, fro a Frogtown wine club member. Of course, when you're out of state, it's harder than in state, but still we, we ship to many, many states. Uh, we have a very large wine club of 2,000 members. It's so unusual for any wine club on the East Coast to have that many wine club members and also have the type of recognition. Also, go online, and I don't want to take up time. And it's hard for me to talk about myself, really. <laughs> but go online, and there's a lot of information on Frogtown, frogtown.com that explains the fact that we are a world-class winery growing estate 
wines. Mm -hmm. We don't purchase any grapes. In fact, we sell grapes, like I mentioned, to Wolf Mountain. And also that we are just in a classification beyond uh, anything that could normally be managed on the East Coast. Okay. So uh, let me repeat what, uh, let me answer the, the question. Tell you me again you compared question. this region to Bordeaux. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. So um, viticulture areas are primarily classified in their macro weather patterns. That's a very large region of which the wine growing part of it is a small portion of a very large region. For instance, the, the Galana Plateau. The Galana Plateau is our American uh, viticulture area. It's a fairly large, although probably, if not the smallest, one of the smallest AVAs in America. And that would be our macro weather pattern. In France, the macro weather pattern of where my bride and I, uh, if you will, developed a liking to and a knowledge of Bordeaux, France. So Bordeaux, France, macro weather pattern is macro. So the macro weather pattern of the Lanaka Plateau and Bordeaux are the same, called maritime, dramatically influenced by the jet stream of the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. While the jet stream is, of course, the western jet stream in next to Georgia, the eastern jet stream uh, next to the Atlantic region of uh, France is eastern. They are very similar, although the jet stream on the east side is higher. So we don't match up directly straight across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, uh, Bordeaux is more north, but warmer because the jet stream is more north there. So we match up weather pattern-wise to Bordeaux. The other uh, uh, aspects of, uh, of weather patterns are uh, meso, which is a smaller localized region, and then micro, which is what you do at your vineyard, how you trellis something. Your viticulture practices develop your micro climate. The other aspect about grape growing is soils, of course, and the primary soil uh, of, of the Dolotica Plateau is not red Georgia clay. It's a sandy clay loam made uh, as a result of chists that is stones rubbing together, breaking down over the millennium, creating soil. The type of soil is a clay, is a sandy clay loam, sandy clay loam. So when you break down the contents, our soil here, like in Bordeaux, is primarily sand, followed by clay, and of course the organic matter loam. So we match up really closely. Again, uh, Virginia Tech, uh, gave me the heads up in terms of uh, defining what a viticulture area is. Uh, it was a simple way of taking what I knew about Bordeaux wines and learning more about growing uh, Bordeaux wines and in the type of area. So yeah, the, the wines here are elegant finesse wines, like mm -hmm. all pretty much continental wines. They're grown in a humid environment, just like Bordeaux, France. They're not grown in an arid uh, environment, sort of like the areas uh, in Spain, uh, which are very, some of the areas are very arid, lack of rain, not humidity. There's so much about humidity. Yes, it causes disease pressure. Yes, it causes it much more difficult to farm. But there's so many things that causes that to make a style of wine that is not big fruit bombs, big intense fruit bombs, where in the world there was never wines like California wines. No place ever produced for hundreds, thousands of years, nobody produced California-style wines. Then California comes, and it's arid, the big fruit bombs, not necessarily elegant. I could tell you some of my fellow winemakers in California, their primary objective is to make more elegant wines, more continental-style wines. Can it be done? Sure. There's ways that even in California, you could grow more elegant grapes. Here in Georgia, well, we can't possibly grow California-style fruit. So we have to make wines, finesse wines, elegant wines, and that's what we do.
They definitely do. Well, we appreciate you so much doing this with us today, and yes. you're a wealth of knowledge, and um, let's just say cheers. Cheers Thank to Frogtown. Yes. Thank you, CK. Get a visit. <laughs> okay, TJ. <laughs>